Well, welcome and good morning to you if you're here in my part of the world here in California. And it's good evening to our Science Circle leader, Chan in the Netherlands, where I believe it's now about 7 o'clock and getting dark. And hello to Jess, where it's very early in the Australian morning. I think it's about 3 o'clock or so. Jess, it's amazing. I'm so glad to see you here. I proposed this topic to Jess before the coronavirus crisis, and I'm happy how lucky it turned out to be timely. Maybe this is a very good time to look forward above and beyond the current news. So let us step out of the present for a moment and look to the future, say 20 years from now, from our 2020 perspective. Our current times are transitional for sure. A year from now, it may be a fading memory of yet another tragedy. And these may also be transformational times, rapidly fulfilling patterns already set in social reforms and scientific innovation and in my particular field of education. And we're going to be turning to national intelligence officers who, since 1979, have been making predictions 20 years into the future it's a coalition of government, academic, and private sector, uh, senior experts on a range of regional and functional issues, and they talk about technological paradoxes. And paradoxically, some of the innovations that have the most promise for our benefit may also be a detrimental means to our harm. And while we uh, might have abundant and cheap energy, which is a game changer for sure, and inexpensive access to universal information and health care and quality living, we may also face threats of privacy intrusions and technological failures as well as technological divides. And these are issues I have been following a number of years as an educator and as a journalist and also as a social worker. I'm one of those road running adjuncts uh, that for some 20 years now designing and teaching on ground and online classes specializing in transcultural methods serving international programs and students and I currently teach for several universities and programs they are right now each one of them closed uh, having closed their campuses and are making a mad dash to remote teaching and i've invited some guests from those universities today to check out what's happening not just in virtual education but immersive education and some may be here or at least watching the recording uh, remember how overwhelming your first days in a virtual world were? Well, some of my guests are going to be feeling that as well. We sure need to remedy that for an easier, uh, easier entry, I think, into the world. Uh, perhaps a feature that projects them straight to a seat with full vision, yet minimal uh, interactivity as a start. Some way to make this a little more welcoming uh, for our guests. And before I was an educator, I was a journalist for national and international media and covered the fall of the Soviet Union in the 90s. And that was another transformational time. How often do we get to witness the fall of an empire? Well, it looks like at least twice in a lifetime. And I also worked in community and international economic development for programs including USAID and UNESCO, Head Start, and elsewhere, always trying to stay current and forward thinking. And I've published a number of journal articles on the future of global learning and how to develop transcultural distance learning opportunities. I've got a link to my UNESCO uh, article on the signs to your right if you'd like to take a look at that. And there's also links to these slides as well as we go through. We're going to be looking at a number of slides. I've got about 110 of them all together. So strap in, hold on tight, and let's get going. Uh, I have been trying to stay current with the rush of daily news, especially as it relates to education. And here are some of the more salient articles I've seen over the last few weeks. Uh, an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education says that out of this coronavirus crisis may come some changes for the better. 
such as collaboration between campuses rather than competition for students and where students enroll in a network of learning rather than one specific college or university. Another article from Inside Higher Education suggests we focus more on master classes in areas of high demand uh, as a lower division gateway. Also low residency options where students have more choices for online learning and take on expanded off-campus projects and uh, community-based learning. Uh, and another of their articles said we should be engaging more international students through virtual exchanges in global education platforms, such as what we're doing right here today. With 1.4 billion children around the world now living with school cloatures, well, the Khan Academy founder, he said on NSNBC that he's seeing new registrations for his program by parents. Well, they soared by a factor of 20 times what's normal. And it's a free nonprofit site with extensive learning resources for children and adults. And it's been supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. If you have any kids at home that you're homeschooling, you're really going to want to check this resource out. Oh, and another uh, article I enjoyed in the New York Times. People are now virtually visiting the world's top museums. People who have may have never done so otherwise. And I've heard about people taking uh, their kids on virtual Disneyland rides. Uh, on YouTube, you can do this start to finish, jiggling the kids uh, on your lap uh, and pretending like it's a roller coaster. And uh, also virtual cliff diving in Hawaii and visiting virtual reality worlds such as this and how quickly we've adapted to current times. People going on virtual vacations and safaris. Yes, I've seen that. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, all these uh, article links as well, if you just click the uh, PDF sign uh, with the slides over to the side there, you can get a copy of a PDF of these slides and all the links should be uh, active, at least most of the links should be active. And then one final uh, plug uh, is, uh, well, the Journal of Distance Learning Administration, the article is titled, Can Global Learning Still Save the World? And the short answer is, Yes, I believe so. Education is the so-called silver bullet to many problems in the world. And that's my own uh, article I published two years ago by the uh, University of West Georgia. And it might be even more relevant now. And again, the link uh, will uh, in the slides will take you directly to that article if you'd like to see a copy of that. You know, I really love this quote. I'm not a big sports fan or a hockey fan, but uh, this is saying we shouldn't base our vision of the future on our current mindset and position. And as hockey superstar Wayne Gretzky says, a good hockey player is where the puck is. A great hockey player is where the puck will be. So. As we look at a number of predictions and trends today, uh, let's do it from a perspective of where the puck will be, say, 20 years from now, so we will be ready for the action ahead. I love looking at the chat. I know that's where the fun stuff is, but there was a, there was a woman once in the art, uh, audience at one of these, and she said, don't read the chat. That's where the devil lives. And I got to tell you, it can be so distracting. So uh, I'm sorry if I'm missing some of the great stuff or even a question uh, or two. I'll try to catch them all towards the end. And one of the darkest points on the horizon, I believe, from our current day perspective, is an evolving useless class of people. That's what the Guardian article uh, calls them. Uh, oh, thank you, everybody. Uh, so tolerant of me in the chat. Um, and these are people who are not just unemployed, but unemployable because there simply won't be enough jobs. So what will then we do with them? Well, interestingly, the article says they might be spending increasing amounts of time in 3D virtual reality worlds, which 
may provide them with the excitement and emotional engagement they could be missing in the real world outside. And speaking of useless, I think we're now seeing what really works out there in the world. Amazon delivery, food delivery, social media, how effectively mass media uses streaming services. Isn't that amazing? Our evening shows coming at us live now on Zoom and our own ability to isolate ourselves through extended practice. I think we're also seeing uh, who is truly essential to our survival. It's the frontline workers we so often discounted in our earlier times. And it's not just uh, blue collar uh, factory workers on the chopping block. Artificial intelligence is coming for just about everyone. Software publishing, computer design, professional services such as legal and marketing and accounting. And they say the best defense against getting cut is more education and diversity of skills to navigate all the shifts. And it may feel like the world has taken a gut punch right now and we're on a downward spiral. But if we look at the trends over the last two decades, we might see we're actually doing pretty good. Uh, over some 20 years, extreme Poverty has fallen several times over for those living on less than $2 a day. Hunger has decreased by half or more in large country regions. Uh, child labor at hazardous work has decreased by 40%. Global life expectancy increased by six years over a 25 year spread. And we're now living twice as long as we did just two centuries ago. Uh, child deaths by age five have fallen by half over 30 years. People around the world are shooting up in height. Look at that jump since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, it's due to better nutrition and living standards. Homicide rates have fallen around the world and stockpiles of global nuclear weapons are declining. And more people around the world are living uh, in democratic countries and more people are going to school longer. Solar power is getting cheaper. And as we look at uh, these different trends and technological developments, uh, let's keep in mind that the slopes and cycles of hype uh, innovations, they go through this as, as do our own personal relationships, don't they? We start out on a high of inflated expectations and then we slip down into the trough of disillusionment and recovering from that to climb back up a slope of enlightenment and wisdom and then achieving an informed plateau of productivity. I know we've talked about this before and you can see how this hype cycle plays out for a number of emerging technologies. You can see 5G uh, just hitting the peak of hype right now and autonomous driving is already slipping into the trough of disillusionment. So let's start right now a whirlwind tour of some pretty cool tech coming our way, uh, starting with power, which is a big game changer as it becomes cheaper and more accessible for everyone. Here's a good look. I love this. This is something that would look good in a backyard. It's a glass sphere, uh, solar harvester, and that it concentrates both sunlight and moonlight by 10,000 times and collects as much output as a standard panel four times its size. And we are developing fully transparent solar cells, which would allow any window on a building or our car windshields and even our smartphone screen to become a photovoltaic solar cell. Uh, here's another interesting project. Bill Gates is backing a solar project that uses artificial intelligence to concentrate sunlight to a single point. And this creates temperatures hot enough to make cement and steel for local construction in remote places. And they're going to generate their own power to do that. Uh, and scientists. 
at uh, UMass in Amherst have developed a thin film of protein nanowires that can create power right out of thin air. And they do this by sucking up atmospheric humidity. This is an interesting uh, innovation there. Uh, in Australia, hey Jess, in Australia, scientists are working on a method to convert energy from sunlight and water into fuel using a naturally occurring protein to create hydrogen cheaply and safely. And there are entire towns in Norway powered with tidal energy. Every day along a coast, the tides come in, the tides go out, and uh, creating a massive surge of energy easily tapped with simple spinning giant propellers and the global wind energy also using giant spinning propellers well that should continue strong growth you can see miles and miles of them driving to las vegas through the california deserts one of the questions is uh what are we going to do uh with all these oil uh possessing uh, nations uh, the oil producing regions around the world as we start going to other forms of power. And here's a prototype of an aircraft we may be flying come 2040. It's basically a flying wing uh, reducing drag uh, and powered with electric fans. Uh, the seating looks like they're really going to be packing in a lot of passengers. I don't think that's going to be very comfortable from what I can see of the diagram here. We're also going to be seeing more magnetics uh, in propulsion. Uh, the world's first magnetic uh, levitation train in China scoots along at 270 miles an hour. That's about 430 kilometers per hour. That's a pretty fast ride, but Elon Musk's hypertube train would still beat that at 800 miles per hour, traveling between Los Angeles and San Francisco in just 30 minutes. Housing uh, is also going to benefit from newer and cleaner technologies uh, such as these cost and energy efficient solar floating homes. Uh, they're going to be 1,000 square feet. Well, that's a good living space, about 12 meters in diameter, 4 meters high with a roof topped by solar collectors. That looks like a pretty good living to me. Uh, we're also going to be... Uh, Printing homes. Here are some samples of 3D printed houses created right on site using local clay and uh, putting out zero waste product. Several homes can be printed at once using multiple uh, crane printers. That looks very promising. And for those of us who would like a life at sea, I'm a sea captain myself. I wouldn't mind floating on a city at sea. And here are some floating cities that could become a reality even here in the 2020s and helping to resolve, resolve problems such as overpopulation and rising sea levels. Uh, here are construction plans in China for a prefabricated self-sufficient island designed to be zero carbon, energy efficient, and producing its own food with vertical farms and fish hatcheries. And this city is called Noah's Ark. It's a self-sustaining city designed for a post-apocalyptic world. It's got terraced agricultural fields that collect water. And from Japan, uh, here are plans for Green Float. It's a floating ecotopia designed to house one million people with vertical farms and living spaces. And here's a plan for Haiti. Uh, it's a collection of artificial islands called Harvest City. And the center of the floating city is dedicated to urban functions like housing and office space and education, while the outer areas are made of agricultural lands. And here's a floating city that actually goes places, as many as 10,000 people living and working and traveling together. <laughs> it may be a while uh, before this starts sounding good again. And medical care will continue with some amazing breakthroughs. Uh, robotic deep field surgery, heart and brain operations, where the doctor may be in Tokyo and the patient is in a remote village. 
somewhere across the world. And robots are proving perfect for eye surgery. Those of us that may be apprehensive about it, well, uh, with a surgeon's hand, even the pulse of blood uh, in the surgeon's thumb is enough to hurt the accuracy of a cut. So we'll be doing much, much better uh, with robotic surgery, especially when it comes to the fine tuning stuff. Uh, robotic baristas, they're maybe making our coffee perfectly, which is bad news for Starbucks 95,000 coffee makers that may be replaced by a machine that never sleeps and doesn't require health insurance. And of course, uh, robots, well, they've been replacing human workers for decades. Robot workers, robot rescuers, and now we even have robots for children. It's a touch-sensitive robot horse that will customize, uh, customize play for this happy little girl. And then the 3D printers, we're to the point now where pretty much we can print whatever we want. We can print organs, we can print dental work and dresses and houses and guns. And we can do this right from our desktop 3D printer. This guy, he printed himself a home dinner, uh, including a piece of pizza, look at that, in the shape of Italy. And even the plates and forks he used to eat it, he printed those as well. We're going to be able to print organs and skin and faces, customized and forever young. And here's some developments in 3D lasers. Instead of printing, they actually cut away the stuff we don't need rather than print it. And we are pretty much at the point right now, if we can think of it, we can make it. Do you need a USB ported Coca-Cola cooler? Well, they can make that. Or here's a wood stove, I love this. It generates power with a USB charging port uh, for your smartphone or uh, <laughs> tablet. I am sorry, I am getting uh, sidetracked looking at the comments. I just love this stuff. That's where the fun is. I know that's where the fun is. Uh, rather than being here, trying as hard as I can to keep it moving, it's so much fun, more fun just sitting in the audience. Uh, or how about this? This is a desalinator, and I love the uh, spelling on that. A desalinator uh, that produces some 15 liters of water daily. Uh, and it runs only on some power with no moving parts and lasts up to 20 years. And one billion people around the world are lacking in access to clean drinking water. And this right here is some life-saving technology. It may even uh, ease a few wars. And then there's just some of the fun stuff. What a great idea this is. It's an app that shows what different brands and colors of makeup might look like on you without the muss and the fuss. And then let's talk about uh, some of the developments in computers and the internet. Well, we've come a long way very, very fast. It was still in my lifetime. The internet first sparked to life. A uh, short email between the original nodes of UCLA, UCSB, Stanford, and the University of Utah whizzing along at 50 baud. If anybody remembers what dial-up was like, and that promptly crashed the first internet. And now the uh, web has quickly become sort of an akashic record and conceivably logging every word and image uh, ever created by us humans. And it keeps getting faster and faster, uh, quantum computing using transmons and entanglement for subatomic sub weirdness where we can now perform a highly complex calculation in just three minutes uh, that would have taken earlier computers 10,000 years to complete. And boy, don't they just look so cool. And we want the web to work faster too. It's a, there's a collaboration now working to reduce web page load times from 5 to 10 seconds per page uh, down to a near instant few milliseconds per page. We're not going to be waiting 5 to 10 seconds for a page to load anymore. It's going to be near instantaneous. And of course, users uh, will have less of a time investment in their loaded page, so we may have to work harder 
to keep them here with better uh, content. And now we're also digging into immersive technologies and those that give us a sense of place along with the global interactions that come so easy now, uh, regardless of where we might be in the world. We want to walk and fly and play and touch. And of course, once students discover how much fun there is to be had here, it becomes harder to keep them focused on learning. We know about that. Uh, there are more virtual world platforms than ever before, and uh, more will be coming, no doubt. UCLA has just built a full-scale campus on the uh, Minecraft server just in time for the virus uh, shutdown of the campus. Uh, Sansar is making headway as a 3D immersive platform with some interesting educational possibilities. And of course, for 15 years here in Second Life, I have been designing educational resources and you can get a few landmarks uh, in the sign of right now we're looking at there's a race for the interfaces with the virtual world gear we'll wear and the battle is uh, underway for the headgear and what it might look like now that we can lighten it up a little bit and chop off the cables and uh, even possibly this will be replacing our smartphones and pads uh, here in the uh, years to come if you haven't seen it, this is what it looks like from the other end. This is what a 3D camera uh, looks like, taking a complete range of directional video and then stitching it together in a full world panorama. And uh, something to keep in mind with all this shiny new tech that may be rapidly immersive and coming down in price, we need to remember that much of the world is still using much simpler and slower technology. Of the 6 billion mobile phones in use worldwide, 5 billion of those are in developing countries and uh, used as a primary online access to agriculture, health, education. And uh, keeping that in mind, we need to ensure uh, that our online social and educational services are formatted uh, for that large population, accessible on a cell phone with as many resources as possible. And here's a course I designed in customer service for the Sailor Academy. It uses text and read along audio and video clips in its lessons, all formatted for smartphones. And it's a free course if you'd like to take it or refer a student. You might even get uh, uh, college credit for it. And the link is on the PDF slide file if you take a copy of that. And we also need to consider uh, that technology, just for the sake of technology, it's not only, uh, always a good thing. When computers were given to Cotopaxi men in Ecuador for agricultural use, uh, instead the men started accessing porn and scorning their traditional ways. And when the women of the Wapishana and Makushi tribes in Guyana began successfully selling hammocks on the internet and making a little bit of money, well, they were ostracized by the jealous men of the tribe Technology is not always necessarily a plus. Globalization, you're right, is not always necessarily a plus. Boy, I've been getting a lot of uh, offers here. I will try to catch those later. Uh, in a university study, they found that after giving one million disadvantaged middle school kids networked home computers, that over five years there was actually a persistent drop in reading and math scores as the students use the computers for games and social media uh, rather than studies. Another example there of technology actually taking us uh, down. There is one of the dichotomies, one of the paradoxes of technology we were talking about earlier. And of course now we're used to cameras everywhere, perhaps more per square foot in Las Vegas than anywhere else in the world where every movement and facial expression is observed and analyzed. All part of Skynet's plan, <laughs> says Mike Shaw. Now see, this is why I love the comments so much. That's where the best laughs are. 
And uh, speeding tickets, well, now you get speeding tickets by camera. They're more common, uh, complete with a shot of your license plate and the smiling driver perhaps talking on her cell phone. Another punishable uh, offense happened to a friend of mine not too long ago. And the Google Glass story, well, that may have uh, played out. But it was interesting to see what threats they posed the Google Glasses by the sorts of places that were banning them, which were bars and casinos and schools and, of course, rules against watching porn in public. We don't want to see that, do we? And it may be facial recognition uh, features that pose the greatest privacy threat. Uh, Facebook's Deep Face program now has an accuracy for recognizing faces that's just as good as our own human ability. And our governments may well take advantage of that. Uh, the Janus program, run by the U.S. Director of National Intelligence, uh, is collecting photographs of people's faces in this vast database using powerful algorithms to pair those photos with existing biometric profiles. And if that just turns you off, well, here are some tips if you want to thwart facial recognition te technology. First of all, create an off-balance asymmetry between the left and right sides of your face and apply makeup in unusual tones and directions. And also conceal your nose bridge if you can, since that's a key facial mark, uh, marker right there, perhaps a long strain of, of a strand of hair uh, twisted around your nose. Vic, uh, his phone doesn't even recognize his own face <laughs> in a mask. Uh, uh, Mike doesn't think he's going to be able to pull that look off. Uh, Mike, uh, don't underestimate your powers. I think you might do, uh, <laughs> do it just fine. Uh, here's another technology that might be an unwelcome intrusion into our lives. Uh, commercial drones may soon be delivering our new toys and our dinners. Uh, and here in Southern California, we recently had our first arrest by drone. Uh, they hovered it in front of the fleeing suspect and gave orders over the speaker until they could arrive. And I imagine it won't be too long before these drones are actually tasing people into submission. It's not that big of a leap from where we're at right now. Uh, lots of our current technology uh, originates in military use, including the Internet and Silly Putty and even the Slinky. Uh, this is a tactical high-energy laser that can lock onto an incoming shell traveling at 1,000 miles an hour and explode it right in flight. Greetings to our drone overlords, is <laughs> one of our audience uh, out there today. Uh, it would be nice if a drone could administer a blood test, a virus test. That would be wonderful. I think we're going to be seeing lots of that kind of, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, here's a look at the soldier uh, of the future, wired with tech that will make troops safer and more formidable out there on the battlefield. Uh, hasn't the world declared peace during this vi virus outbreak? I think I have an all warring party set down their weapons. Has anybody heard uh, how that's going? I haven't heard much about that one way or the other. And uh, here is this gun <laughs> shooting robot that can fire 1,000 rounds a minute. Even just a second of bullets at <laughs> that speed is going to do some substantial damage. And with all the technological advancements, we still uh, remember it's the simple things that might impress us the most. Uh, like the smart kid who found out he could hack the million spent on disk copy protection with just a 99 cent marker uh, covering up an outer track. Or this guy uh, who suggested instead of building a thousand cell phone towers, why not float a repeater aloft on a weather balloon? And that required only three balloons to cover every square mile of North Dakota. What a savings that was. Or the Danes, uh, who invented the live straw that can filter out waterborne diseases such as typhoid and cholera, dysentery and diarrhea that 
kill as many as 6,000 children every day. And these only cost $3 uh, each. I bought one myself just in case. You can get it on Amazon. Or this clever invention. It helps this young man roll about 100 pounds or 50 kilos of water back to his village. And what a smart idea. Yeah, just so, so simple. And these guys. Uh, who suggested that as we dump our waste plastics around the world, why not uh, form them into some useful shape, such as, well, what may allow water bottles to snap together like construction toys to build uh, air-insulated houses. And for sure, it is the simple things that can do the most harm, box cutters on a plane, a uh, bottle of paint thinner and a big lighter on a South Korean subway or just a tiny virus that can close down an entire planet. And that is a whirlwind look at some technology. I think one thing that may be made clear by looking at some of these uh, new technologies that there should be plenty of stuff for everyone to live well. Abundant energy, comfortable housing, high bandwidth access, open education, safe water, nutritious food, 3D printing of our most everyday necessities. And the problem as always is how do we distribute our abundance? And I know some of you in the audience today may be students somewhere in the world and I sometimes brag to my younger students that our older generation developed cell phones and the internet and some cool games and, of course, some of the greatest music ever. And now it gets passed on to you, a new generation. Your greater challenge is to be fair and just with all our abundance. And Albert Einstein once said, it is easier to split the atom than to purify the human heart. And we may never achieve that purity, but your challenge is to take us forward with clarity. And no doubt, once the dust settles and the sky is clear, we will see a brighter way ahead. And I thank you.